Derek, thanks for joining the football weekend. Thank you for having me, Jack. Well, we're here to discuss a phenomenal Bayer Leverkusen team and the season they're having. They have a few hurdles left, um, but I kind of want to to touch on a couple of recent results that they've had to maintain their unbeaten record. Uh, last weekend, they scored a 97th minute equalizer against Stuttgart to save their unbeaten record, and it was the, actually the second 97th minute equalizer in a row that they uh, were able to secure in the Bundesliga to maintain this unbelievable unbeaten record this season. How do you explain these powers of recovery and survival in this Bayer Leverkusen side to always get the goal that they need? Well, first of all, I think there is no logical explanation for what we're seeing. I've been commentating on football for a long, long time, and I've never really seen anything quite as dramatic as this in terms of goals that are meaningful near the end of matches. This is what we're talking about, goals that can change games, that can win points. And, you know, some teams are quite good at doing that, but doesn't necessarily translate into actually winning points. But this has been a big part of Leverkusen's success in this calendar year, not so much in 2023, but since 2024 began. And I remember commentating on their game against Augsburg, which was potentially a bit of a banana skin that they could have maybe slipped on. But they just kept going. And I think that was quite symbolic of how they've gone about doing it. And that is by playing their game. And you think about football and you think about teams who are chasing the game late on. And sometimes even a pure passing team will change its style. And suddenly everything becomes hectic and it becomes a bit unrecognizable and players become twitchy. Leverkusen don't do that. That's the one thing you'd have to say about them. They are true to their own rhythm and to their own passing game. And it doesn't deviate. Yeah, the personnel might change. They might bring on different players. But they have utter belief in their own ability to break down the opposition. That's what we've seen time and again. And somebody else asked me about this recently and said, yeah, you know, there's got to be something sort of magical or mystical about it. I said, well, maybe so. Uh, but I don't believe that it is just coincidence. I believe that this is down to the way they have drilled themselves and the fact that they genuinely believe that the style of play that they adopt and with the players they have in their squad, and by playing that game, they will ultimately tire out the opposition because I think tiring out the opposition has also been a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Amazing to get those two results against Dortmund and, and Stuttgart, two of the top teams in the Bundesliga. But as you say, it, it you know, it wasn't always this way where they were sort of scrounging draws to keep the unbeaten record alive. They've won 38 of their 46 matches across all competitions, as I understand it. And they have blown some people out of the water, uh, you know, playing that distinctive style that you mentioned. Yeah, I was in Leverkusen commentating on the game against Bayern, which they won 3-0. You know, just think about that for a second. People have this season, maybe people who don't watch the Bundesliga so much, have said, oh, Bayern are having a terrible season. Bayern are actually having a normal season for them, if you add it up, you know, from start to where we are now. It's pretty similar to what a Bayern season might look like on average. But Leverkusen blew them out of the water that night, winning 3-0, didn't flatter them one little bit. They were better than Bayern. And they looked as though they were going to win that game convincingly from the start. Just had that feeling about the way they went about their business. And so this is what they can do. And this is what they have tended to do. And these draws that you've mentioned, you know, they've come since they clinched the Meisterschale, since they actually won the Bundesliga against two of the better teams in the league, against Dortmund, who, let's not forget, are Champions League semi-finalists, and Stuttgart, who have been the surprise package, but an absolutely brilliant team. They and Leverkusen have been the best stories in the Bundesliga this season. But they can do it in, in a number of different ways, and they do tend to beat up on the opposition. And it comes, again, from just this high level of technical excellence Xavi Alonso has put his own stamp on the team. You know, if you look at how they play, it's quite similar to how he was as a player. You can absolutely recognize his handprint on it all. And 
you know, the question is, as we speak now, is this unbeaten run domestically, internationally going to continue? There's every reason to believe it will. Yeah, it is quite amazing. And particularly for it's a, it's a team that and a club that historically has not been known as tremendously successful. Uh, they've had some some good spells in their history, but at one point they earned the nickname Never <laughs> uh for continually coming up short in their pursuit of trophies um, and disappointing their fans. How does this fit in that history, this new era, when in the 90s and the early 2000s they were mocked almost for coming up short? Yeah, Never Cousin is the one that has uh, sort of become a thing in English. Uh, in German, it's more Witzekusen, which is the, the, the nickname that haunts them. Witze meaning vice, so runners up, Cousin, if you like. But now we're talking about Meister Cousin, which is doing the rounds, and uh, Triple Cousin, uh, because the, the treble is very much on, and we could be talking about that in the near future. It, it is quite hard to square the circle because. This has been part of their history. And, you know, they've been a, a, a good club. Uh, if you think about when they first entered the Bundesliga in 1979, prior to that, they were bouncing around the lower leagues. And it wasn't necessarily logical that they would become a Bundesliga club. But since 1979, unbroken in terms of their presence in the Bundesliga and regular participants in Europe. And of course, they've won a European trophy before, 1988 against Espanyol. I remember it very well. They did it over two legs and they won the day at Bebokai before the National Knockout Cup competition as well. But this is new territory. And I think for people of a, a certain age in particular, it is quite hard to square that circle because uh, there is this reputation for blowing it. It's slightly unfair because if you think about the two near misses in the Bundesliga and actually in other competitions as well, but specifically Bundesliga 2000s, you know, they, they did have it in their own hands and there was that awful performance against Unterhaching that still gets played back from time to time when Michael Balak scored an own goal and they lost the title on the last day. They had control of the situation. 2002, when they could have won three trophies, including the Champions League. And if anybody remembers that Champions League final at Hamden Park against Real Madrid, people remember it for Zinedine Zidane's brilliant goal, one of the great goals ever scored in a major European final. But uh, I think what gets lost is Leverkusen actually matched Le uh, Real Madrid in the course of that game and for long periods were even better than Real Madrid. So I, I always regard it as an unlucky defeat in the final, but still it haunts them a bit. And then in the uh, <clears throat> Dea Bepokar final against Schalke, they, they lost that game as well. So they had the chance of, of three um, trophies, Bundesliga, which we didn't mention, 2002. They weren't absolutely in control of that going into the last day, but they could have won it. And they didn't. So these things can happen in football, but people have tended to um, sort of revel in, in the whole thing a little bit, maybe a bit too much. Uh, but here they are with a brand new set of players. And I think it's worth reflecting on something that René Adler former Leverkusen goalkeeper said recently, he said, yeah, all this talk about, you know, Witzekusen, Neverkusen, you know, pick your insult. Um, I doubt very much if players like Granit Xhaka or players like Ezequiel Palacios or Victor Boniface, you know, you name your Leverkusen player. I doubt very much if these players know what Witzekusen is or even care because it's ancient history as far as they're concerned. They're simply playing for a club with teammates, they all seem to get on with each other really well, and there's a unity of purpose about it. Yeah, and there is no shame in losing to that Zinedine Zidane no. volley back in 2002. Absolutely fantastic. And that was a fantastic Bayer Leverkusen team with Michael Ballack, as you say, Zé Roberto, Lucio. A whole, there was a whole crew of, of amazing Brazilians in that team. Yeah, and they've always regarded that as something important, having Brazilian players and South American players generally in the squad. It was. It was a really good generation that Leverkusen had, and they weren't able to, to keep that team, as is often the problem. But um, they're interesting because they're not universally loved. There are reasons for that, going back to the fact that you have the Bayer Corporation involved. If you want to dig a bit deeper, 
you know, you can also say that they are not uh, a modern construct. It's not as though Bayer is using the football club as a marketing arm of Bayer, you know, to sell their products. They're not. And they were set up as the, the factory 11, the Werkself, as I know, the factory 11, the, the, the factory team of Bayer. And without Bayer, there wouldn't be a Leverkusen as we know it. You know, there wouldn't be a, a town of Leverkusen, very small community, although within a greater metropolis, you know, very close to Kern, but overshadowed by Kern in terms of day-to-day -day media activities, even though they may well get relegated as we speak now. Um, but that's another story for another day. But yeah, uh, you, you know, they're, they're not loved by everybody, but I think there's real respect for what they have done. And Xavi Alonso, of course, deserves a lot of the credit, but also Simon Rolfes, uh, the sporting chief whose contacts are second to none and who hit the target with pretty much every signing last summer. But yeah, this is, you know, mentioned those previous generations. This is one that I think is going to top anything Leverkusen have done. And uh, they do deserve applause for that. Mm -hmm. Simon Rolfes, who played uh, midfield for yeah. Leverkusen in his time, right? Um, yes, he did. You mentioned that. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah, go on. No, I was just going to say very much a, a symbol of the club and somebody who wore his heart on his sleeve and gave everything to the club and learned under Rudi Fuller, the legendary Rudi Fuller, who was the sporting CEO and Simon Rolfes worked under him. And then, of course, it was a smooth transition to to have Simon Rolfes become the, the sporting CEO, the, the key decision maker when Rudi Fuller moved aside or moved into different roles. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the role of Bayer, the corporation, which this week I learned invented aspirin, which is mm, pretty good work yes. on their part, I think. Um, but it was originally a, a petition from the workers to start this team and what became the, the Factory 11, as you say. How is that? How does that legacy manifest in the modern day for this club? They, they are still called the, the Verkself, as you said, as you pronounced it much better than me. But how, does it manifest in in any other ways in the club culture? Well, if you go to Leverkusen, the first thing you see is the Bayer Kreuz, the, the, the Bayer Cross. You know, that is sort of the defining symbol of Leverkusen. And to paint the picture, if anybody doesn't know, Leverkusen is this sort of Kern offshoot. You have the city of Kern, Cologne which I think most people have heard of and is famous for its cathedral and, you know, is one of the major cities in Germany. And then just a few kilometers away, uh, and you can see it if you ever go to the uh, area of Köln called Mülheim, which I spend quite a bit of time in, you can actually see the, the Bayer Kreuz from there, it's just on the other side of the Rhine across the bridge. And, um, you know, the community itself, apart from Bayer, there's not an awful lot in Leverkusen that people would say is particularly memorable. It's just a community. It's not, you know, it's not like Cologne that has, has the, the dome, the, the cathedral. And so I, I think that is a very important thing to realize, first of all. And, you know, you spoke about aspirin, you know, die Pillen, uh, the, the, the pills. Uh, that's the sort of the, the nickname that's sometimes bestowed upon this football club. So, I mean, it, it's very much there and it, it can be used in a derogatory fashion. But Leverkusen fans, and, and they did a very nice um, uh, choreo uh, recently, TIFO, before one of the games, it was the Pokal semi-final against Fortuna Dusseldorf, which basically in the Nordkurve, the, the loudest part of the Bay Arena, they came up with this choreo that essentially celebrated the origins of Bayer Leverkusen. And I, know, I heard critical voices from afar, some people saying, no, nah, well, all you're doing is glorifying Bayer. But the response so that was, well, without Bayer, there would be no community here. This is how it started. And it was a factory. It was, it was more innocent days, if you like. It wasn't a major multinational corporation. Um, but without Bayer, we wouldn't have this community very near Cologne that we have. So that's important. And um, it, it, it's, I think, difficult for people who maybe only follow peripherally to understand in that area how big a force Köln is as a football force. I'm talking about day-to-day. -day. You know, if you go into a coffee shop or a, or a pub in that area, the talk will be about Köln. It will not be about Leverkusen. 
um, you know, maybe in, in particular labor coups and coffee shops and bars. But generally speaking, they get a bit lost in the shuffle. And there's far more attention paid to this club, Kern, that, that has gone up and down the Bundesliga and, you know, looks as though is heading back down again into the Zweite Bundesliga. Um, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you people are not glory hunters in that area. Uh, but what I have noticed is that a lot of younger fans seem to be gravitating towards Leverkusen. Um, maybe fans who already had those sympathies, held those sympathies, but the membership is up and it's become much harder to get a Leverkusen ticket. Used to be, you know, a bit of a standing joke that if you wanted to experience the Bundesliga, you could always get a Leverkusen ticket. You know, that wasn't necessarily completely true, but but you could do it more easily than Kern, which is still impossible. You know, guarantee if somebody tries to get a ticket for the next couple of home games for Kern, whether they're relegated by then or not, um, good luck. You know, you're just not mm. going to do it. It's not something that's that's attainable. So I think that that is important to mention in the context of, of Leverkusen and who they are. Um, but they certainly are growing uh, this season. And I think internationally, they've made great strides. I, I think they've, they've been at the forefront of that much better than, than many other Bundesliga clubs. Is the sort of distaste that maybe some in Germany have for a uh, buyer owning the club is that tied up in the 50 plus one rule in Germany that, that clubs by and large are owned by the fans or at least controlled by the fans with some exceptions Bayer Leverkusen is not the only exception, but for the most part, that is sort of the, the, the club ownership model, right? Yes. That's the sort of the de facto position. There are variations on the theme with regard to whether you, you have a company that's outsourced that looks after the football operation. Uh, and sometimes you have a separate company that, that looks after the club or, or is the club, so to speak. And that is under 50 plus one. It, it does vary from club to club. But um, broadly speaking, yeah, Leverkusen have an exemption based on that. Um, and so you know, it is argued, let's just put it this way, it is argued that this allows them to have advantages that other clubs don't have. It allows Bayer to be able to do certain things that uh, other clubs aren't able to do. And and they would say unfairly because they would say other clubs are, are playing by these rules and that German football, and I would agree with this, German football is better for 50 plus one. There's a reason why things that seem to be happening in, in other leagues and, uh, you know, for want of a better way to put it, selling one's soul uh, can't really happen as easily in Germany. And it's down to 50 plus one on the fact that you simply can't come in and buy a, a, a German club as a whole. You can't come in and do what happens in England. Now, some people maybe in America would think, oh, well, what's wrong with that? But if you understand German football culture, you'll know that, um, part of what makes it all magical, part of why we have the largest attendances anywhere in the world, part of uh, why things are affordable, part of why your public transport is wrapped into your match day ticket, all these things stem from 50 plus one. So I think that that is the kind of the feeling. There's not the same animosity towards Leverkusen. And I think this is because of the history, because of going back to 1904, being a a factory club. There's not the same animosity that you get with Leipzig uh, or with Wolfsburg or with Hoffenheim, even though they've, technically speaking, taken themselves back into 50 plus one. Um, that's something that's just happened um, relatively recently with Dietmar Hopp, the, the longstanding club patron. But um, it's complicated, let's just say. But uh, yeah, there are still people, especially in the, the greater Kern area, who feel that what happens with Leverkusen is not quite right. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I should have clarified at the beginning that 50 plus one is essentially that you can't have one majority shareholder, right? Yeah, you, you essentially can't have... Um, the, the most somebody can come in and, and buy is under 50%. So you always have this um, option for the fans to be able to, to outvote you know, say somebody, say somebody who currently owns an English club wanted to come in and buy a, a German club. Well, they can't come in and outright buy the club. Um, um, so they, the, the fans have the right to be the, the majority. Mm -hmm. And that ended up being decisive in the, when the Super League came calling because basically the Bayern Munichs and Borussia Dortmunds of the world, it was, a, it was sort of a non-starter with their fans, right? <laughs> 
it, it really would be a non-starter with with any group of fans in Germany. Uh, I think um, it, it was interesting to me because uh, from outside, English fans got very worked up about it, and it sort of took that for them to get worked up about it. But they have more or less given up when it comes to other issues and and trying to um, trying to keep things in a way that might make it more representative as far as fans are concerned. You know, I'll give you an example. We have in German football in the last few months these protests, and it's very hard to explain concisely, but there was a, a move by the clubs to bring in private equity investors on a very small scale basis, to be honest, compared to what happens in England or even in Spain. It was a very small um, proposal, you know, broadly speaking. Um, but the fans, essentially, certainly the hardcore fans were not having it. And we had protests at virtually every game with tennis balls thrown on and chocolate coins. And the message was was pretty cl crystal clear. The fear that fans had was that once you allow private equity investors into the league, this was to the league, not to individual clubs, then give them an inch, they'll take a mile. And before you know it, we will have um, our games transported to, you know, the example that was given was Saudi Arabia or somewhere like that, or the USA. Um, that's simply a non-starter in German football. It's been interesting to me to hear this about Spain and maybe England about taking games to um, to the USA. If you think the Bundesliga is ever going to move games to the USA, forget that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you would lose something. You would lose some of the, the local flavor, the, the community that has built the, the club into an institution. You know, it, it, yeah. it sort of needs to have that place. Well, I, I've argued this for a while, and um, not everybody listens to me on this, but I always you know, give the example of Schalke. Schalke are a club in the second division now, but with a tremendously rich history. You know, I've been to a few of their games this season, and they sell out every match, uh, and they would sell out every game in the third division as well. And if you ask Schalke fans, oh, you know, if, if, if you had this um, possibility of bringing in somebody really wealthy who could prop you up, but you would lose your rights as fans, uh, as members, as you have now. Um, what would you think about that? And they will all say, no, we'd rather go to the fifth division, you know, because because this is the experience that we have as, as Schalke fans. We want our club and we want our club to remain here, you know, in the roots of our community, in the Ruhrpott, in Gelsenkirchen. And so I, I think it's something that maybe not everybody totally gets, that, um, you know, and I always put it this way, that football is a wider extension of community in Germany. It's first and foremost about the local community and the fans who have kept those clubs afloat for generations and memories from one generation to another. And context and setting really, these things matter in Germany. And I've always said you could have... Um, you know, Bayern playing, I don't know, uh, Leverkusen. You can have, have those two teams playing in, you know, name your, your random city somewhere else in the world. And it might be a good football match, but it wouldn't be the Bundesliga because the missing ingredient would be the local ingredient, the fact that the game is either in Munich or it's in Dortmund and the smell of Bratwurst in the air and uh, having a beer with your friends before the match at the same time, at the same place as you've done you know, every year going back to, you know, however long it is. And I think that's the one thing you just cannot replicate. And you can try, but it would be a facsimile of the Bundesliga. And I think, honestly, a lot of fans would say, I'm finished with this now. I'll go and watch fifth division football because um, this is not German football as, as we know and love it. And I think um, it is something for... Um, governing bodies in other countries to, to have a long think about. And I see a sort of a resignation with English fans on the subject that, well, the ship has sailed, what can we do about it? But German fans don't feel that way. And the reason they, they don't feel that way is they are still empowered because of 50 plus one. It's really important. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Schalke fans are the opposite of Newcastle fans. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it is. And I think people think I'm joking when I say this, but I'm really not. You know, uh, it's, it's true of all these big traditional clubs. And there are many now who have gone into the second division, but they wouldn't trade that for being bankrolled. They, they don't have a desire to be bankrolled. Um, I, I think that's something that we do have to convey. And I was surprised because, you know, I'm from 
talking to you today from just a couple of hours north of, of Newcastle on the other side of the, the border here in Scotland. And um, I, I thought that Newcastle fans, you know, some might feel the same way, but uh, they, that being bankrolled in the UK context and in, in UK football um, seems to be something that is desirable. Mm -hmm. Well, it is Bayer Leverkusen who are top of the pile yeah. in the Bundesliga for now. And you, you mentioned... Chabi Alonso's impact yeah. and obviously there's the tactics the the prominence of the two fullbacks Grimaldo and Frimpong um, but what has he brought you know tactically and also in terms of mentality he seems to have this transcendent calm on the sideline which I'm an Arsenal fan as you may be able to see his his fellow Basque countryman Mikel Arteta maybe doesn't share this quality but he seems very calm for a top level manager what, what has he brought in his own person yeah, he's definitely brought, brought composure to Leverkusen. He's definitely brought those qualities. He does act as a coach a bit like he acted as a player, and he was always very classy. And it's been interesting, you know, talking to, to players who played with him, especially at, at Bayern. Uh, they have all said things like he was always destined to be a coach. He, it felt like he was a coach while he was still playing a few years when he was with Bayern. So I think he was almost destined for this. And I've been surprised, frankly, how quickly he's been able to get that across because he's still a relatively young coach, certainly at this level. But he looks as though he's been doing it for years and years and years. And he hasn't changed the style too much, although he has. You know, they're definitely better in possession than they've ever been, Leverkusen. Um, but I think there's also the factor with Xavi Alonso that when he has, since he has come in there, I think you're dealing with a generation of players who all respect him. So even the youngest players in the dressing room, you know, they all follow football. They will all know Xavi Alonso, the player. They will all have been familiar with Xabi Alonso, the player, and, and what a class act he was. And that doesn't necessarily get you um, titles or anything like that. But I think it is part of it. I think if you have a coach who is already credible like that, and to these players, you know, completely credible, then um, it, it is a big advantage. I think it's just a, a case of a very good fit. And I think the fit got even better with the puzzle pieces that were added by Simon Rolfes and his staff last summer. And you mentioned Grimaldo. That was a bit of a weak position for Leverkusen. They didn't have a good solution on the left-hand side prior to Grimaldo. And when he came in, it was without an awful lot of fanfare because he'd been at Benfica for a long time. They got him on a free transfer. I mean, imagine that, a player like that on a free transfer. Never had played for Spain before. Now he has. Um, 17 players at last check um, have made their debuts for their national teams uh, in this campaign, Leverkusen players. I mean, that says everything. Grimaldo was one of them. Um, so I, I think that having somebody like that and obviously somebody who, again, respects Xavi Alonso to the nth degree, you know, they are fellow countrymen in that sense. And um, Granit Xhaka, the other one who, you know, you know, uh, I don't need to tell you about Granit Xhaka. Again, probably needed this at this point in his career, probably needed this move to go somewhere and be the choreographer in chief um, at the age he is now, which is a great age for somebody in that position. And again, this was something Leverkusen had lacked. They had, they had had problems on the left hand side. They had had a lack of mature leadership, I think you would say. I, I think you would have said before looking at them, a lot of very talented players but not many sort of leaders in the upper age bracket football-wise. And so by signing Xhaka, Jonas Hofmann, another one, you know, bargain in modern-day football, 10 million euro because of a clause they were able to trigger to price him away from Borussia Mönchengladbach. Um, having two players like that to fit who they already had, you know, and who they already had... Uh, Players like Frimpong and Jonathan Ta and Odilon Kosunu and club captain Lukas Radetzky and Patrick, Patrick Schick, who of course has been injured, uh, was out for the best part of a year. Um, and then, you know, Victor Boniface, who they signed and got off to a fantastic start before his injury. He's back now as well. And we haven't even mentioned Florian Wirtz, who's, you know, the, the, along with Jamal Musiala, the talent of, of the current German generation. So, 
it's a team really without discernible weaknesses. I go up and down that team now, and I think to myself, where is the weakness? You know, honestly, there is not one position where you would say, "Ooh, that's a bit iffy." Or maybe they can be exploited there, or maybe I, I, I really I don't think there's there's any Achilles heel in the squad, and and that applies to the subs as well because um, they play a back three, and you can sort of per many three from from four or five because they have Stanisic from Bayern, Josip Stanisic, so they got on loan as well. And he can slide in, actually, there, or even into Frimpong's position, that right wing back. And it's just a, a, a world of luxury that they're living in right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we saw Jamal Musiala starring uh, last night for Bayern Munich, but Florian Wirtz this season has been unplayable at times. What... Has has he gone up a level this season in your estimation? Has Chevy Alonso unlocked something new in him? What, what's going on with maybe Germany's brightest talent? Well, I think, first of all, we have to remember he was out for a long time with that um, cruciate injury that he picked up actually in the, the meeting with Kern, and he was a Kern player. Um, so there was that edge to the fixture. And, um, you know, it was probably reasonably going to take him a bit of time to properly come back from that. But I think Xavi Alonso has demonstrated that he's the perfect coach for Florian Wirtz. I think he's just getting better as part of the natural process for somebody of that age group, somebody who you know we saw straight away had the talent and has taken it and, and run with it. And I think having these other players around him has helped him. I think having Granit Xhaka to be the, the brain of the team, which I think is the best way to put it, to be the brain of the team there in that deeper position, and he's often the man for the second last pass, that allows Wirtz to have terrific freedom, which he exploits. And he has a flair for those dramatic moments. We'll never forget the goal he scored against Freiburg, solo effort, where he just kept dribbling and beating opponents and then firing at home. And I think there'll be plenty more to come. So um, I, I think it's great for the national team as well that you have these two talents, uh, Wirtz and Musiala, and Julian Nagelsmann has worked out a way to incorporate both of them into his starting eleven by playing a, a sort of a 4-3-3 with the two of them as as dual number 10s, if you like, or you know, attacking attackers behind the main striker. And um, yeah, I can only imagine where his career, where Wirtz's career is going to take him in the years ahead. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the uh, the Bay Arena earlier, and I'm wondering, I've heard that the atmosphere is sort of family-friendly more than, you know, a cauldron of ultras. But I'm also interested, I, I try and ask people, if you're going to a match there, or in, in Köln, I guess, is there a local delicacy that people need to get? Is it bratwurst? Uh, what, what do you get on the way to the game? <laughs> well, uh, bratwurst is everywhere. Um, so so you, you will find that, uh, you know, not just at train stations, but uh, every block pretty much. Uh, and you could spice it up by having a, a currywurst, uh, which is a variation on the bratwurst theme. It's basically a, a chopped up bratwurst with um, spicy curry sauce and curry powder that's uh, that's been a staple for a long time in german football and also just in in everyday um german life um beyond that in terms of uh, the current area has loads of little sort of quirky uh, food types but i'm not necessarily sure i would recommend them um in this forum <laughs> um what i would say is that they do have uh, in the stadium itself they have uh, what they call the veggie corner which is quite innovative so they have this little area where um, if you want to experience bratwurst but are vegetarian or, or vegan, then you can have your own vegan bratwurst and uh, another vegan dishes or vegetarian dishes that are sold there in the, the veggie corner. So have a look for that in the, the Bay Arena itself. The one thing that people, of course, have to know about the area is that if you're drinking beer, then you're going to get Kirsch everywhere. And that applies to Leverkusen too in, in, in that area. And what's so special about Kirsch? Well, it's served in these very small glasses. And the idea is that it should always be served cold. And um, you can get into trouble with it because um, you think you're not drinking very much. And the tradition is, you know, you, you drink it and then you, you have a, a, a waiter who comes around with a big tray of you know, permanent tray of these um, of, uh, new uh, glasses of Kirsch. And he'll just give you another one. Uh, or she'll give you another one. And if you don't put your beer mat on top, you, you'll keep getting them. And then 
you lose count of how many you've actually had. You think you haven't had, had very many glasses of Kush <laughs> at all. Um, but it's a special tradition in, in that area. Sounds like Oktoberfest, yeah. Um, I mean, speaking of, you you are obviously a lover of German culture and, uh, um, you know, you, you speak it, I guess, fluently, right? I yep. mean, when did you start to uh, pick up German and, and did you live in Germany when you were younger before you were, you know, working there professionally? Well, a few things happened in my life that sort of um, brought it to life for me. Um I'm talking to you today from Aberdeen, which is my home city, and uh, people don't know where Aberdeen is. Aberdeen is on the northeast of, or in the northeast of Scotland, on the North Sea coast. And in the old days, uh, before there were roads, the, the old highways were waterways, and so trade was done quite a lot between here and places like Hamburg in Germany. It's not that far, really, just as you travel along the North Sea. And one of the great things was growing up. This is way before internet was even thought of. Um, we had a very good radio reception. I was able to get radio channels from Hamburg, um, as I say, just just uh, you know, not far from here, as the crow flies, and. Um, so uh, that coincided with the World Cup in 1974, um, which was the first World Cup that I watched and watched it avidly, became obsessed not just with the football, but with the geography of uh, Germany. And of course, in those days, we had two Germanys, West and East, and then uh, began learning it. We usually pick up languages in, in school uh, here in Scotland around the age of eight or nine. And I was adamant that it was going to be German. Luckily, I was in the class that took German and just found that it really spoke to me. And I think helped by the fact that I was listening to radio every night and listening to Bundesliga uh, uh, matches on radio a lot of the time. And it was my best subject at school and uh, always dear to my heart. And then um, I did an exchange with a, a school in a rural part of Hessen, right on the border of the two Germanys. Uh, and when I say right on the border, I mean just, you know, metres from where the actual border was on the western side, but looking over into the east. And that taught me an awful lot. The whole thing taught me an awful lot language-wise. And I went back to help out in the local school there uh, in the period between um, finishing uh, secondary school and going to, to university. And um, when I joined the BBC uh, as a, a young reporter, I thought, well, sadly, I'm you know sort of kissing Germany goodbye and all my, my German studies. But it's really only in the last sort of 15 years that it's come back to being really important. I always, you know, would go to Germany regularly. Uh, but then I started working for channels that had Bundesliga rights and it sort of grew from there again. And um, in the last few years, since what, 2015, I've been working for the Bundesliga as one of the world feed commentators, which is a great labor of love for me. And uh, while I was London-based, I was working for both BT Sports and prior to that ESPN UK, who had Bundesliga rights. And now as the lead commentator for ESPN in the USA uh, with their Bundesliga rights. So I, I spend uh, quite a bit of time now in Germany, quite a big chunk of the year now is uh, in Germany. And um, as I say, there's, there's nowhere I enjoy being more, both uh, personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. Well... I must ask because I grew up on the FIFA video games like many people my age in, in the U.S. And, and beyond. And you are now the voice of what's it's now called EAFC after a slight licensing dispute between the two parties. Um, do you remember when they came to you, when EA Sports came to you and asked you to, uh, to be the voice of FIFA and what that felt like in that moment? Yeah, I, I can remember it. It was a, a rainy day. I was actually in Dresden, in eastern Germany, and I was going to a, a Dynamo Dresden game that night. And I got a, a bit of a cryptic text from somebody who it was all I'd say, very vague, saying there was some interest in me from uh, all they could say was it was a major video game producer. They couldn't say any more than that. Would I be prepared to have a chat? I thought, okay, that sounds a bit mysterious. And it didn't really clear. The fog didn't really clear for a, for a few days. And then it became apparent that this video game producer was the big one, EA Sports. <laughs> and it just turned out that the producer of the video game at that time had been following my work for a long time, going back actually to my days as the voice of the Champions League on ESPN. So it's maybe a good lesson that 
you know, always try to do a good job because uh, there'll be somebody listening who maybe someday will be in a position where they think, oh, that person could could help me a little bit. And mm-hmm. so so um, had been following my work and, and thought that, for you know, for whatever reason, the way I did commentary would be a, a good fit for the video game. So we, we talked for a few days and then I was invited out uh, to Vancouver to fly out to Vancouver to to meet the people behind the game and did a small audition of my own work just to see how it would it would um, slide over the, the game as it was at that time. And um, the one interesting part of it was that I couldn't really say anything to anybody for about eight months until the new edition of the game came out. So we'd agreed that I would do it, I'd be part of it, because the Champions League license had come up and at that time EA Sports wanted to put their own stamp on the Champions League. And again, that came back to the fact that I'd been the Champions League voice for ESPN when they had rights to it in many chunks of the world. I think that's the one thing maybe Americans didn't realize at the time. We were broadcasting the Champions League, not just to the USA, but to Africa, to Australia, to parts of Asia, South America. It was going to many different places, Canada. Um, and um, so I had to keep, I had to sort of keep that as a, a bit of a secret that I was um, I was doing the, the Champions League for EA Sports. And then the announcement came out in uh, July, by which time I'd recorded everything. So that was, the again, the mysterious part. You're going into a studio. People say, what, why do you keep going into a recording studio? What are you, what, what are you recording? I can't say. Sorry. Can't say. <laughs> it will come out in due course. <laughs> I mean, when you go into the studio for the for the games, do you come in with lines that you want to use? Does does EA say we need these from you? And it must be an, an interesting balance because you probably can't be too specific with a lot of the play calls, right? They need to be sort of general, generally applicable. Yeah, it is a, a team effort. It's a collaboration, as I always say. And you know, I think some people imagine that we go in just saying whatever we want and not at all it's actually quite disciplined in that regard so the producers come up with a a concept for for what they want because it has to match obviously the game and it could well be you know maybe on a particular day maybe we're doing um i don't know shots from outside the penalty area that just go narrowly wide or shots that the goalkeeper has saved and um, so they'll give me those parameters, but then what they want is they want me to come up with my own organic material. So it sounds like me, you know. So it, it, if I were just to read off a page what somebody else had written, you know, thirty times, it wouldn't really sound like me. It, it would, it would sound completely different. So um, the challenge is, of course, coming up with thirty different ways to describe these these scenarios because. Um, you know, there aren't necessarily 30 different ways, um, but we do our best with that. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty much, to be honest with you, I find the best work that, that, that we do on that is when it is completely organic and, and almost not thought through too much. You know, so if I have the context and I have the parameters, I like to say, OK, let's roll, let's just go, you know, and I'll just say what I would say, because that's me. You know, that's what I do in a live game. I'm not thinking about what I'm saying. I'm not looking at a script, reading what I, you know, might want to say about a particular situation. I'm just commentating. So uh, I think it works best um, with with that. But um, it's a team effort. And, you know, sometimes the team will say, no, I didn't think that worked as well. Can we try this a different way? And uh, yeah, we we bounce off each other pretty seamlessly that way. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I'll let you go in a minute, but I, I'll ask you one more thing on Bayer Leverkusen sure. because as by my calculations, they have seven more matches. If they are able to pull off perfection, they will have seven more matches, including two cup finals. Um, what do you see as the most challenging? We're talking Wednesday ahead of the match against Roma. Daniela De Rossi, Roma club legend, has sort of revived the capital club. They're in a new way. They have the, the match that we'll be sort of previewing on this podcast this weekend in the Bundesliga. Where do you see the pitfalls for them as they try and complete the perfect season? I think that the Roma games could have their difficulties. We saw that last season. As you've said, Jose Mourinho is gone. De Rossi is there. It's sort of a new wave at, at Roma. 
they haven't forgotten that home leg against Roma. You know, the feeling was that they were crushed by anti-football, and they were, you know, and Mourinho does that better than anybody. But it, it was awful to watch. It was a real anti-climax. And, you know, maybe it's good from that point of view that they're on a revenge mission here. But I think that if they are to, to taste defeat in an individual game, you would say logically a way to Roma might be the one where that is more probable than in others. Um, Frankfurt away won't be straightforward. I say that because Frankfurt still have challenges themselves. They still have to to make sure that they um, uh, get sixth place. They're defending sixth place. But I, I'd be surprised if Leverkusen lose that game. Then they've got Bochum away. Bochum are fighting for their lives in the Bundesliga. Uh, actually, the last team to beat Leverkusen, Bochum. Uh, imagine that, the final day of the last campaign. And they beat them convincingly as well. So Bochum, second last game. And then Augsburg at home, another team fighting for Europe. Uh, and then they have the Pokal final against Kaiserslautern from the second division in relegation trouble in the second division as we speak now. So I would have to give it to one of the Roma games as being most likely. But um, I've given up predicting that Leverkusen will lose a game this season because they... they seem to always find a way, even against Stuttgart, when uh, I think some of us were thinking, OK, this is finally the one where, without Xhaka, who was suspended, uh, they're not going to do it. But um, they truly are a remarkable team, and I hope they get the recognition around the world that they deserve, because, you know, I think about Leicester City in England and all the plaudits that came their way. I think this is a better story than Leicester City, if they pull it off. If they pull off a, a treble like this, and an unbeaten season. I, I don't honestly know how story-wise you could top that. I, I don't know how it could be topped, you know? And um, so I, I do hope that people look at it and go, wow, how, how have they done this? They've not done it with the biggest budget, but they're playing like a team. You know, when Leicester won the Premier League, that they did it in a scrappier fashion. Nobody would have said that they're the classiest looking team you've ever seen. Full credit to them at the time. They did what they had to do. But this is a team that oozes class, um, but it's not a budget that is up there with the, the big clubs in European football. So I, I think it's something to savour. I think it's something we probably won't see again, although I wouldn't be surprised if Leverkusen are back doing this again next season. But I don't think we'll see it from another club anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, Arsenal's Invincibles of 2004 are still spoken of in legendary terms, yeah. and I think justifiably so, but this is all competitions. I mean, that yeah. Arsenal team went out of the Champions League. They went out of the FA Cup, I believe. I mean, this is a whole different animal. It is, and, you know, time and again, they have come through the different tests, and, and uh, it's not an accident when, you know, you think about Karabag and the Europa League as well. You think about some of these games they've had where they have faced adversity, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, this is finally when they lose the unbeaten record, and they simply don't. They, they simply pull through, and, you know, West Ham was another one where, uh, you know, they were outplayed in the first half, but... Um, put it right in the second half and, and managed to to remain unbeaten that night as well. So I think it's um, it's a real credit because the Europa League is a grind as well. You know, and I've heard it said, "Oh well, it's not the Champions League." Yeah, it's not the Champions League, but it is a grind, and you play um, you know a lot of games in far flung venues. You play Thursday, Sunday, which some will say, "Well, it's the same as as Wednesday." Saturday, but Champions League, it's sometimes Tuesday, Saturday. It, it, it's it's not easy to be unbeaten when you have Europa League commitments and you look as though you might go all the way in the Europa League as well. Yeah, well, we'll have to see. Derek, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, it's been great chatting with you about Bayer Leverkusen, Chabi Alonso, the Bundesliga and German football. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Jack. Pleasure to be on with you.